Welcome back to the Strength and Speed Podcast. I'm your host, Conquer the Gauntlet Pro, Evan Preparis. I do not have Brennan with me for this episode, but I do have another guest. Before we get into that, quick word from our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Folds of Honor. Folds of Honor is a charity that gives scholarship money to kids whose parents were killed or wounded in action in U.S. military service. If you were paying attention to my recent event, Endure the Gauntlet, where I did 48 hours of obstacle course racing... Folds of Honor was the charity we raised money for. We raised over $5,000. The charity lines are still open, so I'll post that link underneath this podcast. You can donate if you want to or if you like what you're hearing. So with that, being this an episode brought to you by Folds of Honor, I have a special guest on the line. Um, Now, this is a bonus episode. It's not a normal OCR episode, so we're not really going to talk about OCR, but we are going to talk about a topic that's pretty heavy and relates directly to Folds of Honor. Now, I've seen grown men in the military cry at two things in my entire life. Uh, One is the end of SEER school, which is where they pretend you're a prisoner of war for a couple of weeks. Uh, Pretty awful experience, but also very rewarding at the same time. And the only other time I've seen uh, grown men in the military cry is at funerals or memorials of their friends. Um, So my goal for this episode is not to lose emotional control, but uh, we're going to do our best there. But on the line, I have... uh, Jenna Farrell and Jenna and I went to college together and so did one of our other good friends uh, Jonathan Graspa and Jenna and John got married and then shortly after that he was deployed to Iraq um, died in April of 2007 uh, an IED blast and uh, left Jenna as a very young widow I believe you were 23 is that that right Jenna not quite 23 I was a few months shy of my 23rd birthday Gotcha. All right, so that's what we're going to be talking about this episode. We're going to talk about John, what it's like to be a gold star um, wife, and what it's like to be a widow of a fallen soldier. So, Jenna, welcome to the show. Thank you. So, now, um, you know, kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode, before we get into start talking about John and what the, what your experience has been like, but, you know, too often I see on Facebook, you know, everyone's big on social media, People post stuff about Memorial Day and they hashtag and like some comments and you know they feel they feel good about themselves. But there's a lot deeper meaning and a lot deeper reason to these stories. And I wanted to bring someone on the podcast who I know personally, so I have a strong personal connection to you and to John. And I wanted to share some of those stories. All right, and uh, you know maybe you were like me, where you grew up in a town where it's not common for people into the mili- enter the military, so you may not even know anyone in the military and much less someone that's been so deeply affected. So that's kind of why we're doing this episode, kind of bring, bring that reality home to everyone. Let's, so let's start, kind of set a baseline for everyone, Jenna. I mean, I, obviously I know you real well, but you know, tell me how you met John and kind of how that relationship started, and we'll go from there. Sure, Corey. Well, uh, I can give you the really long version, but I'll try to keep it as brief as I can. Uh, so... As you know, uh, we were separated by three years in college. I was a freshman when he was a senior. And my decision to join RTC before, right before I I, uh, began at uh, Johns Hopkins for uh, my undergrad degree was a very impulsive one. Uh, No one in my family uh, had served in the U.S. military, in large part because we were, my, my mom, my dad, my sister, and I were the first of our family to move to the United States from the UK. Um, so obviously me deciding up to sit up one day and say I'm going to do this was a little bit of a shock to them. I'd never really been particularly uh, inclined in that direction in high school, let's say. Definitely didn't do any activities that would suggest that that was in the future for, for me uh, or on the horizon at all. <laughs> so a little bit of a surprise and John was of course the, the very opposite at that point. He was about to finish his degree and complete the RTC program and then get to that uh, that pinnacle moment of becoming a commissioned officer, and I was just beginning. Um, so for that reason, I had a great deal of respect initially for him more than anything else because he clearly 
he knew his stuff and he had done very well. Uh, I think starting off even himself in a position where you know he wasn't completely confident, he wasn't um, as uh, as knowledgeable or or as um, sure of himself as he became in a very good way, of course. And that uh, that confidence, that knowledge, that expertise is definitely what drew me to him initially and and led me to want to know more about him. Uh, and I did have the opportunity to learn quite a bit more about him uh, <laughs> during my freshman year when I went through um, a, a period, let's say, of, uh, of great physical and mental <laughs> challenge. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and John was involved in that process. And in fact, he was very intimately involved in that. And during that uh, interact, during those interactions, that time uh, that I spent with him, my opinion changed uh, temporarily, I was a little frustrated, a little, a little upset maybe from time to time because he expected a lot from me and from the others that I was uh, undergoing these challenges with, and that was a good thing. I just didn't necessarily recognize it as such when I was in the moment. I do now. <laughs> so and, we'll, we'll expand on that a little more. So what Jenna's okay. talk, Jenna's talking about is we. We were in a co-ed fraternity together. It's called Pershing Rifles. It's a military fraternity slash honor society slash drill team. And the pledge period is about two months long, and it was it's really hard. Like, even looking back on it, it's still one of the hardest things I've done in my life, not because it's comparatively as hard, but, like, at that stage in my life, you know, I hadn't done anything that really challenged me. And I remember Pershing Rifles, PR uh, is what we called it, like breaking down several mental barriers that has opened the door to a lot of my endurance success today. And uh, John was a senior, I was a junior, and Jenna was a freshman uh, when Jenna pledged and entered the uh, military fraternity. So it's not like a normal fraternity where there's like drinking and, and stuff like that. There's actually, well, a- after you get in, there's drinking, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> before, like while you're pledging, there's no drinking. It's, it's very militant, right? So there's a lot of exercises. It's typical stuff you'd think of at like boot camp type stuff. And a um, lot of like memorization and studying and drill practice and physical training sessions and meetings. It's uh, it's quite a process, and the attrition rate is super high. It was like sixty or seventy percent. Sometimes we'd lose in a complete uh, pledge class at, when I was uh, when I was in there. Anyway, yeah, it's no <laughs> joke. Uh, and, and you know, for me certainly, just to expound a little bit on that part of the experience. I, I would say that before college, I was good at the memorization and the book learning piece and all that. That was great. But uh, combining that with being physically exhausted and literally smoked to the point where it's hard to to gather a coherent thought, that was a new thing for me because, again, I really had never uh, been pushed physically before. Uh, before I decided to uh, to become an ROTC cadet and to commit to that that lifestyle, and so that for me was a difficult piece. Even aside from the pledge period part of it, you add the pledge period, and then you're talking about a whole new level. Um, but that's something that I will always take with me because uh, I know, like like you just said, Evan, it has absolutely made me. I mean, I hate to use the army buzzword of resilient, but it's true <laughs> that that is definitely what that will do to a person. Uh, it, it, it makes you realize that you can you can put up with a lot more than you think you can uh, when you have to, and as a result, you're, I think you're willing to put yourself through some more difficult situations in the future because you know you can do it. It's just a matter of overcoming that mental block that sometimes gets in the way. Yeah, absolutely. I remember during pledge period, um, the final event, there was. It was the first time in my life I ever been to the point where I was so tired and so exhausted that like I didn't care if I blacked out. I was like, well, I hope I black out, and then I won't have to deal with this anymore. <laughs> so I did not black out, um, luckily, and I did finish. And um, it's obviously so did Jenna because she was in the fraternity. But miraculously, somehow, yeah. I guess I was pretty lucky to have uh, very, very great and and uh, supportive people along alongside me to to get me to that point but it was by no means a given i had certainly many points during that pledge period where i thought (laughs) i don't have to do this anymore i i I could just stop today and it would all go away um but ironically although like i said i uh i I was not entirely um let's say feeling too friendly toward john during such (laughs) periods his role in the process 
uh, part of what made me stay was also a bit of the pride factor. I didn't want to look weak or like quitter in front of him or any one of you that was in a position that you'd earned by going through all of that. Now, let's continue on with the story. So uh, you finish pledging PR. Um, you find out he's not really as mean of a guy as he seemed <laughs> for the last two months. <laughs> and right. uh, I guess kind of right. take it from there and um, jump ahead as needed. Sure. So it wasn't too long after that that we started, just we as a, as a group started spending more time together and uh, you know, the personalities being what they were, I would say some people were um, more of the ringleaders of getting groups together than others, and John was pretty good at that. You know, he definitely wanted to take the helm and get, get people, uh, be it to dinner or to the movies or to whatever it might be, just get them out, get them uh, in a place where we could go have a good time. Um, and uh, and so I was, n- I was certainly happy to be done with the nasty part of the process and excited to have all these all these friends that that uh, I felt closer to than than some people I would have known at that point for twice as long, which is the great part about you know what what that kind of experience will do um, to a group of people, and so it was exciting to be a part of that, and I was none too happy or very happy to go along uh, and and participate in as many things as possible, and it was through doing just social things like that in a in an environment after we've been through what was a, a very unpleasant experience that I did recognize that hey okay he's that was an act I got it that was a a requirement of the pledging period and what it's supposed to be and what it what it was to consist of for our benefit really uh and what he really is underneath is a fantastic person um you know truly a uh a committed and uh and in a at that point, not quite a commissioned officer, but I mean, embodied all of the values and all of the things that I was quickly learning at that point were fundamental to being successful and to um, and to, to doing the right thing and to to going on uh, to um, to do what was expected. And those traits, those qualities, as as almost cheesy as it may sound, were the ones that that really did initially draw me to him and uh, and make me look at him in a slightly different way, which obviously became quite a different way uh, yeah. as, as more time went on. And it really didn't take that long. I think it just, you know, sort of a few weeks to a month or so uh, for me to realize that I felt a little bit more than just friendship for him. Uh, and that relatively quickly did blossom into more. And it was, you know, it, we were kids, really. And it was, I'd like to think, beautiful in a way to 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 see this sort of almost like awkward but fun loving friendship grow into something that relatively quickly just by a product of the circumstances that being that he was leaving and I was not uh we had to make a decision you know very quickly near the beginning of the relationship hey is this something that we are both committed to and that we want to try to make work and of course we decided to do so and that of course committed us to then a few years where it was challenging uh, to maintain a relationship knowing that he was initially going to Korea for his first assignment I would be still at school Um, there would be always things that would come up getting in the way of of the times that we uh, would otherwise try to spend together Hurricane Katrina is a great example of that Uh, (laughs) but we always found a way to make it work, uh, and it was that was one of the things I, I often would say to him and, and to other people. It's amazing he he can he seems to, despite even challenges that come up along the way that get in the way of the times we're trying to spend together. He always seems to manage to plan around and surprise me with something that ends up working out perfectly for us to uh, to maximize that time together. And so that's what we did. To add a little more depth, uh, at least from my perspective, so I lived with John his senior year, my junior year, and like I, w- I would describe him as the poster boy of ROTC, right? Like, yeah, I hated to say it like that before, but I mean basically that's what I'm going for. <laughs> he was like, he was the captain of like the Ranger Challenge Team, which is like one of their clubs. He was the captain of Pershing Rifles, another one of the clubs. He used to be the captain of Color Guard, another one of the clubs. So he's the captain of everything. He was the battalion commander 
in ROTC, which is essentially the highest rank you can get. He'd won, like, you know, Superior Cadet of the Year, like, I think all four years, right? So, like, he was, like, the ideal, per- like, that's what everyone strived to be. Um, and then on top of that, like Jenna said, he was the- he had a lot of, organized a lot of the social get-togethers and uh, just all-around great guy, and we had some, we had a lot of good times. I have a lot of very fond memories of uh, college with him. So, uh, you, you guys start dating, uh, things progress, you know, he proposes, you guys get married, we're going to jump ahead a little bit. Sure. So, you get married, I miss the wedding because I'm in Iraq, um, which yeah. sucked, and then uh, how far after that did he deploy? It was quick, uh, and technically it was the second deployment. Uh, the first one was almost just as fun in that I was in training at Fort Lewis at the time, uh, this was back, I don't know if it's the case now, but this is back when we were only allowed to use pay phones to call home, pay phones and letters, that's what we had. And so we had been in the field, I come back from the field, I called him first, of course, didn't get an answer, called my mom, said, this is, this is odd, I, I couldn't get a hold of him, and it, that's not normal. And, uh, you know, she said to me, are you sitting down? And I said, well, no, I'm standing at a pay phone. And she said, well, um, uh, I got some news, and it's that he is in Iraq. And uh, so that was the first iteration or introduction, if you will, that I had to what it was going to be like to to be in a relationship uh, where not only I was obviously in the future going to be on active duty, but where um, my significant other at that time, he was my fiancé, was subject to those completely last-minute uh, engagements, let's call it, that really throw you for an, a bit of an emotional loop. So I uh, <laughs> I guess I, I certainly learned in that first uh, experience that it, it could be pretty rough. The next time around, uh, we had a lot more warning. In fact, it seemed like too much warning, and that was what was also kind of ironic about it. Things changed multiple times during the lead-up to what ultimately, of course, became the deployment they were supposed to go at about the time they actually did end up stepping out the door. But there was a moment there, more than a moment really, where there was some discussion that they'd get pushed back, that they might get pushed back pretty significantly by several months. If that had been the case, uh, John was newly promoted to captain in July of 2006. And if they had waited to deploy until, let's say, you know, sometime later in the fall, he likely wouldn't have gone because he would have instead gone to the captain's career course, which would have been his next career move, that sort of a thing. Um, So it was a lot of back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then it was right at the time he was promoted um, to captain in July of that year that the battalion commander announced uh, to the group, there was a pretty sizable group for it because several uh, lieutenants were being promoted to captain at once and he said hey I know we've kind of been jerking you around a little bit in terms of information flow and what's going to happen but we are in fact going to deploy uh, and it, it's coming and, and it really did come fast once that message was transmitted and we understood that it, in fact it was happening we had originally planned to uh, to have um well, to basically split our time uh, in a very different way from how we ultimately ended up having to do it uh, because I was about to start law school and that was going to be four hours away and so there was a mad rush at the last second to get an apartment, get furniture, you know, get it all set up and and good to go because ultimately he left on July 31st of uh, 2006 and we got married uh, just a month and a half earlier on June 9th of that same year. You've been married for a month and a half, known each other for about, what has it been, three years-ish? Yeah, three, like and a half, three and a half years or yeah. so, at that point, yep. Um, so he, he deploys, um, let's fast forward, jump ahead to April. Um, I don't know if you sh- want to share the events of his passing and then kind of what, uh, on your side, from the United States, what you experienced. Yeah, so... Uh, is something that I almost wish I didn't remember in such vivid detail, but I think there are some moments like that in your life that you just, you'll never forget. There are images, you know, you close your eyes and you'll always see them. And that time in my life, although much of what surrounded it became a blur, that that day, those, those moments are in that category. Uh, so 
I, I knew what to, if you will, expect in terms of procedure because, unfortunately, John and the men that he died with on April 7th were not the first from his squadron to be killed on that deployment. Um, there had been several calls through the uh, family readiness group chain before that, uh, beginning in, a, in November of uh, 2006, uh, to notify family, family members of the entire squadron that they had lost uh, some of their guys during both firefights and other incidents. And um, the period during which uh, John passed, if you look now back at the numbers from uh, that period of, of the Iraq war, I mean, they, they, they peaked, they skyrocketed. It was, it was a bad time. And uh, the, the main source of, uh, of injury and death at that point, unfortunately, was the improvised explosive device. There were just so many of them, um, the, the ways that they were set up and the ways in which they were imp uh, implemented and used against our soldiers were uh, known, but not always. We weren't staying a, you know, maybe abreast of it as quickly as we needed to, and so we were losing a lot of people that way. And unfortunately, that is, that is the way that, uh, that John and the men he was with that day uh, passed away. They were on a supply run to uh, a what they called combat outpost in Zagania, Iraq. It was a little ways from the main base that they were otherwise located at. This is a pretty standard thing that they would have done um, on a maybe not daily basis, but certainly on a regular basis. John decided to go with them that day to make sure that everything uh, was how it should be for the men out of that outpost because it was a relatively new, newly established outfit and that obviously requires more supplies and more, more things to ensure it's secure and uh, as safe as it can be. And so the route they traveled, uh, as I obviously learned later, was notorious for having IEDs sprinkled throughout it and the deep buried kind are the most potentially dangerous, and that proved to be the case here. It was on the way back from dropping off those supplies um, that the Humvee in which John was riding that day, and it happened to be the lead Humvee in the convoy, was hit by a deep buried 500 pound IED. It was detonated by an Iraqi who would have been, from the photos I saw later, sitting somewhat perpendicular to the road in an abandoned building with a small cutout where he could see the road um, in order to literally press the button um, as that Humvee crossed the, uh, the marker, which in this case happened to be a tire with a piece of silver metal on it. And from what others who were in the convoy described um, and from the photos I saw later, uh, the truck was decimated by the blast. Uh, it could be heard back at the FOB and certainly back at the outpost they just departed from. Um, and the, the radius, the blast radius of something like that is, well, it's significant. Um, there were five soldiers in that that Humvee, that truck, uh, and four of them, to include John, uh, died almost immediately. The fifth uh, and final soldier somehow miraculously survived. Uh, his name is Bobby Henline, and he is just an incredible human being. He's gone on to do uh, more work than I could possibly even begin to properly describe here in terms of his work for wounded warriors, his work for soldiers, his work for families of soldiers, uh, his, uh, his many, many ways in which he honors those that were not so lucky. Um, but yet he and John were on the same medevac bird when they uh, flew in to, to evacuate those who had been hurt and, and killed. And unfortunately, uh, by the time they got to the hospital, which was in Balad, um, although John was breathing when they put him on the medevac, he did not make it back alive to the hospital. 
Yeah. I know I, I read some of the medical reports uh, after the incident, and the uh, the damage was very, very severe. And I'm, I'm frankly, it's a, it's a miracle that uh, one of the guys even survived from that, from that I know. incident. So. I don't think anyone even now could medically explain how that's possible. Yeah. Okay, so um, traumatic event, obviously, um, for for that. So you're back in the stateside. Uh, how does that uh, situation go down where you find out? It, <laughs> again, sort of a, an odd turn of events. Uh, certainly nothing I could have predicted transpiring the way it did, but, you know, it's just, it's, it's funny how sometimes these things these things work out and play out. So, like I said, I, I was at law I was in law school at the time. Uh, April is pretty close to final exam time. Pretty high stress, and I I was struggling at the time to, to focus and to get myself in the right mindset to you know really sit down and excuse me delve into exams and everything that I really needed to to be worried about at that point. I was distracted, obviously, by what I knew was going on over there. Ironically, uh, just a week or or so before this incident, John had served as the, if if you will, officiating officer, the stand-in personnel officer for uh, the memorial service to honor uh, a couple of soldiers that they had lost in a different incident. Um, And again, he told me about that. He said, yeah, you know, the... the, um, guy that normally does this on leave so I had to step in and do it it's pretty rough for obvious reasons um, and uh, you know I, I knew about that I, I had sort of that in the back of my mind I was worried about what was going on the news at that time it's hard to think back that long but every headline was another announcement of more soldiers that we had lost that day much less just that week or that month and um, so it, it was not an easy time to to have someone that was my whole world in that world. And uh, at the same time as all of that was going on, my dad had called me on the 6th of April uh, while I was still in Williamsburg, where I was at law school, to to tell me that my um, that my mom um, was was very uh, ill. Uh, she had um, a pulmonary embolism which uh, if untreated or or if, if disrupt I guess if, you, if, if disrupted in a way that that um, you can't reverse can be fatal and she had been about to get on an airplane which would have been one of those potentially fatal ways that things could go very wrong um, and didn't feel well and so went to a hospital uh, before getting on that airplane and discovered that this is in fact what was what was going on and so with all of this swimming around, I thought, i, I got to get out of here. I'm going to go to our apartment in North Carolina. Uh, I feel somehow a little bit closer uh, to, to him there, and I will try to relax a little bit, see a couple of friends that are in Fayetteville, and, you know, clear my mind, and uh, maybe that will help me to focus a little bit better. So that's what I did. Uh, I drove there after class on Friday the 6th, and uh, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, unfortunately while I was driving to Fayetteville, it's about a four-hour drive, um, my phone, which was sitting right next to me in the center console, it went, it didn't ring, it went right to voicemail because the signal was often, this is back, you know, this is not the smartphone era, uh, it was a flip phone, and the signal was was hit or miss, and in this case, it was it had definitely missed, and that phone call was was what would ultimately be John's last phone call to me. He left me a voicemail that I obviously got, but I wasn't able to call him back, and so I was frustrated about that as I was driving. But I thought it's okay; he'll try back later. It'll be fine. He always tries back if he doesn't get me the first time. Yeah, for those for those who are listening. You typically call from like a payphone, essentially in Iraq, like on the base. So there, you can't like call back. Um, so that, just to clarify for some things. Yeah. Go ahead. Of course. So yeah, you can't uh, can't be like, oh, you know, send a text. I just missed you. Nope, doesn't doesn't work quite that way. So uh, I was 
obviously on top of everything else, frustrated that I hadn't had that opportunity. But like I said, I thought later on tonight, I'm sure he'll try. He'll call back. He'll call back. No call. Nothing. Um, he did send me an email to say, hey, are you okay? I tried to call, and it, I wasn't able to get a hold of you. I'll try to call you again later. So when I got that, I thought, okay, that's that's good. That's a, that's a good sign that things are they're okay. Um, and so that was the night of the 6th. I went to bed, and it's obviously, you know, it's an eight-hour time difference, uh, Eastern Standard Time to Iraq. And so while I was going to sleep, he would probably have been about ready to get up, if not already up. When I woke up the next morning in North Carolina, again, it's just, you know, one of those moments where you look back and, and it, it makes more sense than it does at the time in the moment. It's just something about waking up that morning in, in our room, looking around at everything that just felt different. I, I don't know how to describe it other than saying that. It just felt different. I, I just... I can still picture waking up and looking around and feeling odd. But I thought, okay, you know, I, I'm probably just still pretty stressed about all these other things. So I went about the day as normal. I met up with um, a good friend from college who I wanted to say I just saw tonight uh, when she was driving up through Richmond. Um, they had just moved to, to North Carolina and were literally about to get ready to deploy on the, uh, to the same location uh, where John was, or more or less the same location. She and her husband, both of them were about to go, but they had some things to do beforehand, so I tagged along, helped them with those, eventually got back to their apartment, and this was eh, late afternoon, maybe not quite 5 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, and at that point, you know, it was Saturday, April 7th, and I, I knew, okay, I, I, I've got to get some work done uh, before things get, before it gets much later and things get, get too far gone. And it was right about when I was in the kitchen, I think I maybe took a, a little pint of ice cream out the refrigerator to help me, you know, get the motivation to start studying, and that's when that's when I heard the knock at the door um, in the time since John deployed I had been back at the apartment once or twice before uh, and really the only time that I could recall anyone ever knocking before that was when uh, there was a, a, a I don't know I, I guess a kid a, a kid from one of the local schools that was uh, selling newspaper subscriptions and he was you know sort of in doing so you know trying to practice his marketing skills and so when I heard it initially, I didn't think much of it because that's the only other person I, I could think of that it, in the times I'd been back I had knocked at the door. So I, I, didn't, I didn't at that point have cause for alarm. But the apartment door, much like most do, had a little peephole uh, so you could see you know, who was on the other side. And I hate to say that it's eerily like the movies, but it... It really is in that when I looked through the people, I could see two Army officers in their service dress uniform. One of them, as I learned, once they opened the door and introduced themselves, of course, was a chaplain. And I knew that something was very, very wrong. I, I wasn't even willing to accept, though, when I saw them there, that it was what it was. I almost bargained with, pleaded with, hoped my, to myself that it was news that he had been hurt. I knew in my deep down, in my mind and in my heart, that they don't come to the door for that news. But right. I was willing to believe anything in that moment for it not to be what it actually was. Obviously, they, they tell you in person. I'm not sure where the chain went from there, but I know, um, you know, with our military fraternity, I know Gavin was the one who called me, but it started getting called around. Right. And he he called me, and I was actually in the car with my uh, my wife, 
and my sister. Yeah. So the, the funny part is I'm getting choked up now. But when Gavin called me, he, he said I was unemotional. And, uh... Because I had other people in the car, and I didn't right. want them to know. Right. So I was like, got it. He, I, he's like, I don't know how to tell you this, but John died. And I was like, got it. And he, I was like, you got anything else? He's like, nope. I was like, thanks for calling. I'll talk to you later. And I hung up. Right? Like, completely unemotional. Right. Completely, completely stoic. And uh, I just kind of went about my day, and I didn't tell anyone for another 24 Oof. Another twenty four hours. <laughs> how so. do you how do you tell someone that though? You know, there for years, st- even still, I I, I I struggled with and still really haven't come to a uh, an agreeable, if you will, way of telling people anyone really that he died. I mean, what do you say that he died? That he was killed? That he passed yeah. away. It's 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 just a word, but it carries with it so much significance because that was a life, the life of someone that was so much more than just a life. Right. That you feel like you have to give it that proper that proper respect and treatment when you tell someone, and yet the words are so inadequate. Yeah, and the uh, you know a couple fast forward a month or so. Um, we had a memorial service at Hopkins where, we, where all three of us went to school. Yeah. And uh, they asked me to speak at it. And I was going back and forth like, you know, how do you sum up someone like that, someone's life in a couple of minutes? And you can't. Um, but, uh, yeah, I still I still spoke and I, I tried to do my best, but, you know. It's... And you did a bang-up job. It was. <laughs> It was probably the only time that I had laughed since <laughs> this happened because, you know, the reaction that most people have is to tiptoe around and to just try not to say anything to make it worse. But ultimately, those funny stories are sort of what broke that 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 bubble of of nothing but the pain and the, the raw emotion and it was what uh, the following day that a little bit more of that continued uh, after the formal service at Arlington and that was such a relief I, I don't think anyone expects that you want to be able to laugh at that time but if you don't laugh at the, the memories those happy times and the <laughs> the jokes that will so we'll never get old. And what else yeah. do you have? Yeah, I know the the like the weekend of his funeral is still. It's it sounds super weird, but it's like I have such fond memories. Like you said, of just laughing so hard all weekend and just like yeah, enjoying like recounting uh, all the memories and life stories we had together. Uh, yeah, yeah. So like, it's so weird that I have. <laughs> I have these like horrible memories tied with these like super happy ones. I know. Like, kind of balled into this one weekend. Um, but that's you know that's when I look back the good thing. Now at least, what I remember more from that weekend, thankfully, are those times where we laughed and we told the stories, and you know the group got bigger and bigger because other people wanted to listen and they wanted to share their own stories and it just was. You know, you can't replicate that. You can't just, like, get a bunch of people together and make it happen again. But it was so precious right there at that time, and it was just what I needed, you needed, everyone needed. And I remember that so much more vividly than I do the actual service at Arlington. I I couldn't tell you what anyone said. I know I I was there, and I'd seen the photos, and they'll always be hard to look at. But I remember... The happy moments when we got to reminisce about all the good times. Yeah. All right. So, at this point, you're about 23. You're now a new widow. Yeah. Um. Kind of. What do you, what do you do next? Like, what's, 
you know, how do you move forward from that? <laughs> That's a really good question. And, you know, there's a lot of, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of books out there about various self-help topics. There are a lot of, a lot of stories that people share about their own difficult experiences. But especially then, there really weren't a whole lot of just places to turn or people to turn to that I could say, you know, like, hey, how do I do this? Or what? What do I do next? I, I had no idea. Um, I was probably in being as emotional as I was for quite some time, making somewhat rash and impulsive decisions. But even those felt better than just doing nothing at all. Uh, and for for me, it came down to a case of. Can I go back to the life that I was leading and living before this happened and keep it going like like it like it's okay and that and, and like I, I can uh, just stay on this course the same way it was without this basically structure that was my life and I decided that I couldn't do that that I had to make much more drastic changes and that is uh, when maybe not to the pleasure of my parents that you know they, they were not so so happy about it but um, I decided that as much as I did still want to go back to law school at some point and finish it that for the time being I I wanted to infuse some sort of deeper meaning to what I was then going to do myself in the military uh, and so I decided to withdraw from school and go on active duty sooner than would have otherwise been the case if I had stayed in law school for another two years and waited to do it through uh, through those channels. And again, maybe some would look at that and say, well, you were not in a good position to make that decision, and you probably had a bit of a death wish, and both of those things are true, but at the time... I think I needed to completely shake things up because they'd already been so shaken up for me by the circumstances. I was luckier, I think, than some people in that I had the, the flexibility, the, the freedom, if you will, to just take some time after this crushing, uh, just, you know, world-altering event to just not do anything for a few weeks. My brother and sister-in-law were kind enough to just say, hey, come with us out to Washington, which is where John's brother was stationed at the time. And they said, you know, we'll, we'll take care of you. You can just stay with us and figure out what you want or need to do next. And so it was in that process that I ultimately decided to leave law school and go ahead and and uh, go on active duty um, but having that time that that ability to just sort of disconnect a little bit from the rest of the world for a minute is not something that everyone gets to do um, and in those those times after the funeral after everything official is over if you will those are those are the hardest even more so than the notification or the service itself or anything like that because everyone goes back to their normal lives and you don't have that anymore. Even your family and friends around you who are trying to give it to you as much as possible, they can't replicate what you've lost. And so you feel so alone, so different from everyone else, you know, a bit like a, um, like an outsider. Um, you, you think to yourself, like, that you just do anything to be able to transplant yourself back just you know a few days or a few weeks whatever wherever you are in that process at that time to, to when things seem normal uh, and and you weren't on this other side of of this awful awful event uh, you, you know you sort of like I said you do a lot of bargaining with yourself to to think like well if I if I just do this maybe I can fix it and you can't you just can't and for me, it took 
maybe longer than it should have to, to realize that uh, and, and some hard lessons learned uh, in the very hardest of ways were a part of that process. Um, but ultimately I did leave law school and I did enter onto active duty and I made a lot of mistakes uh, in in that uh, initial time uh, when I was a, a new officer uh, that you know I, I I look back on now and think wow that was that was dumb or why did I do that or or you know I clearly wasn't thinking logically I was I was emotional and rash and and I think there was certainly some risk there in that that it could have it could have turned out a lot worse had I uh, had I really lost it, if you will. But that sort of that change in course, that decision to put myself in what maybe was a emotionally at times more difficult position, had to be part of the uh, the healing process for me. I, I just couldn't see myself going back to to law school and sitting in class and and, and being able to to even care at that point about things that seemed so trivial in comparison to what had sort of taken over, if you will, my existence. Yeah, I think you, I don't think there's any one solution that fits all. Um, you know, you eventually found your way back over to Iraq um, as a military police officer. And what was kind of funny was we actually ended up on the same base. I was already deployed. Yeah. And you, you deployed there. So it was good to see you. Yeah. It's good to see you downrange um, in Mahmoudia. So, good times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, you know, for me, the um, if for the obviously I post a lot of shirtless pictures on social media. No. Uh, <laughs> if, you, if you see that, I, if you can see the scribbling on the inside of my left arm, uh, that's a memorial tattoo for John. Um, I also kind of interesting story i ran a marathon so a month after he died it was less than a month it was within that same month i ran the Nashville marathon um with like a picture of him on my back um just, and you know his birth date and uh death date on there and um so i remember this is an interesting story so i remember you know everyone hits the wall at mile 20 so i remember like as i'm running essentially praying that you know like john i'm gonna need your help to get through uh, like the last six miles of a marathon, right? Mm. And um, in our military fraternity, Pershing Rifles, like every line, every uh, year group has a song. And there's only one song that fits for that year group, <laughs> right? Uh, so mine is Vanilla Ice. Um, John's is uh, Back That Ass Up, <laughs> which sounds kind of funny, but it's kind of a long story. But anyway, so I'm, I'm praying for like his help and uh, – I come around the aid station at mile 20 and they're playing back that ass up. And I was like, the chances are <laughs> effing astronomical that this is the song that is playing at this specific moment in time. Um, I had a great last six miles on a side note, ran a PR. Uh, good day for me, but um, just kind of an interesting story there. Yeah, the little things like that, they, 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 they get you from time to time and I've had my share of them as well, um, and uh, you just kind of think, I, I couldn't have done that, or I, I couldn't have uh, overcome that last little obstacle, whatever it was, without that extra bit, that extra push, and I have often thought that that, there, that, that must be <laughs> something greater than just myself. So... Now that you're, we're a couple years removed, right? That was back in 2007, um, so a little over a decade ago. Yeah. Um, like, what good has come of this, or has any good uh, come of this incident? I think, yes. And I, I, I hesitate in saying that because it's difficult to think that good could ever come from such a a truly awful and, and just emotionally devastating event. I and, and John's family I, I did, I think, what most people in that situation instinctively try to do initially, which is to look for uh, good that we might be able to do 
both for causes that he believed in and to help others uh, that find themselves similarly situated. And doing things like that, although you wish that you could be doing them for any reason other than why you're doing them, truly do give you the sense of purpose that initially may just get you through the day and then ultimately gives you something more to actually hang on to and, and realize, hey, okay, I, I, maybe I can uh, still go on to lead a full good life. Maybe that wasn't the end of everything that was good for me, and that, that, that took a long time for me personally. to, to, to It took a long time to get to that point, let's just put it that way. Um, and doing some of those those projects, if you will, helped. And, you know, so we started pretty small uh, with asking for people to donate in lieu of flowers to, um, to create a scholarship at the university where, at Johns Hopkins, where we, we both were students, we we're all students, um, so that a cadet who embodied the same values and the same attributes that John had as a cadet and then an officer could be recognized uh, for their performance and their potential. Um, so we started there. Um, I was involved with a group called TAPS, um, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, in writing articles, you know, pretty blunt articles uh, for a little while there about, hey, this is what it's like to, to be a you know, 20-some-year-old military widow. These are the things that help when people say them to me and and these are the things that really are hurtful that I I know come from a good place but just don't really help that much Uh, because I I think that that's a commonality that you you have to unfortunately experience and learn the hard way people want to help they want to do anything they can but it's so hard to know what to say or or what what will provide that person with with any comfort and sometimes the words you use might might ultimately end up hurting them more than help them. Um, so I, I felt like it was, in some ways, a bit of my job to, to be that person. Like I said, there at that point weren't books or, or uh, widely established support groups for this kind of thing. Those were pretty fledgling. And I, I also became a part of many of those. Um, I went to Washington, D.C., in fact, with some of those women to help the... Uh, the folks that were putting together what's now the the Survivor Outreach um, Services, uh, when that program didn't even exist, SOS, it's now sort of the the military's go-to organization for helping families. At that point, it was still just a you know, a pipe dream, and, and they needed some, some input on how to put it together. And so we, we talked to them about our experiences and the things that would be really helpful um, so that others wouldn't have to necessarily go through some of the things that we had, we had uh, the, and that had made it more difficult for us rather than helping us. Um, and um, in addition to some other memorial projects, some other articles, uh, and and then of course now sort of reversing, if you will, the role to try to be a bit of a mentor, if you will, to others that have been in this position. Uh, the biggest uh, and most significant for me project that I undertook was to create a um, a veterans project that that helps those that are in need of of uh, legal assistance at uh, at Ohio State, which is where I ultimately went back to law school. They didn't have one at the time. It was, at that point, it still is a very much an emerging trend for law schools to have these clinics or projects to uh, allow students to work with uh, licensed attorneys to provide veterans that, that need that help with the assistance that they otherwise don't have the means to uh, procure. And I used, in, in doing so, half of the, uh, of the life insurance money that I received from the Army from John's death to endow it so that it will exist uh, beyond when when I'm gone as well. And, you know, I, I, all of these things, all of these, these projects and these um, endeavors, no matter how large or small, uh, be it, you know, running a race uh, in his memory or in his honor or, or a big project like the Veterans Project, all of them continue to provide just, just a 
little bit of the comfort that makes it possible to keep living um, and a sense of purpose that uh, allows you to, to hope that despite how horrible the circumstances were to get us all to this point that you know, a little bit of, of good for others can come out of it. Yeah. I know, uh, like for me on a personal level, the um, one of my one of our other good friends, Pat, was shot in Iraq of in uh, 2003 in the summer. Yeah. Um, so between that and uh, John's death, I know, like personally, I have a very like right now attitude where like I don't I don't want to wait for things to happen. You know, I, oh let's right. go on that trip next year. Like no, we're going on the trip now. I don't care if it's not the best time. Um, just because you gotta, just kind of never know what tomorrow brings. That's right. And uh, I'd say, like immediately post, <laughs> immediately post, um, you know, incidents like this, I'd say that's a little more destructive type behavior. Exactly. Like, let's go out partying right now. <laughs> um, you know, like especially, uh, you know, I was in Iraq in oh five oh six, and then we were back for a year, and we knew we were going back in oh seven, oh eight, and um, you know, with his death on top of that, like it was very like, all right. You know, we, we don't know if we'll still be alive next year, so let's, you know, let's live it up now. But now, you know, I, I take a lot of that and I apply it to, um, you know, personal stuff and racing and all, all that stuff. So I think it's um, on that, for like for me personally, it, it's made me a, a better person or a more proactive person. Yeah. yeah. I'll say that. Um, and then this past year, uh, my daughter's... Uh, was about to turn three at the time, so I got we got to you know my wife's family's from Maryland area, so you know when we're in the area, I try to go visit him at Arlington. Um, so I got to introduce my daughter to him at his grave, which was uh, which was nice, you know, like um, just kind of sharing that with my even though she's only three, it's pretty I, like she I feel like she still understands it. Um, so I got this uh, my wife took a picture. She's like trying to comfort me. <laughs> at the actual grave site um but it was nice to kind of share that along you know um especially with like being in the military people always like oh you're a hero and it's like no i'm really not you know like i just like i was going over there i was running around iraq and you know just having a good time and like um you know the real heroes are in arlington they don't get to come home so uh it's nice to introduce my daughter to him yeah and hey, kids are remarkable. They they understand and pick up a lot more than we think they do. So I am sure that, although she may not realize it right now, that 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 sunk in. It's in there somewhere. Yeah. We're gonna start wrapping this up. Um, kind of give us, you know, that the decade has passed. Just kind of give everyone, uh, kind of where your life's at now. Um, so we don't end this on a complete bummer. <laughs> I don't think we would have even if we had did it a minute ago. I think <laughs> your daughter, I mean, she's really cute, so she could steal the show. Um, yeah. <laughs> but so I, again, like I said, I, I think maybe I, maybe I took a little longer than some people would to get to the point where I could see and, and look forward to even a future. Uh, I really was convinced for some time that it was it was all over for me. The best part of my life had come and gone, and I was only, you know, 20-something at the time, and, and that was going to be it, and that everything else that I sort of half-heartedly tried to uh, make myself excited about after that was just that. It was just, you know, it was, it was a, a bit of a front to, um, to to try to infuse some life into, my, into me uh, when I didn't really feel particularly genuine about it uh, and so it was it was a struggle for, for some years to feel that even just some of the dreams and the hopes and goals I'd had when it was in that like let's say former life could still be realized in the new reality that I was facing and one of those of course was well am I, how am I going to go back to law school um, and as I alluded to a minute ago, of course, I ultimately did, but I, that was another thing that took took a while for me to feel like I could and wanted to because it was so associated in, in many ways with what had been such a dark, dark time in my life. Um, but I also was really bothered by having started it and not quite, and not finished. And I knew that 
in many ways that, that John would want me to have to have finished it. He wouldn't want uh, what happened to him to have been the reason that something I had worked hard for and, and then would have to work harder for again to get back to uh, never came to fruition. And so that was that was I would say one of the initial turning points for me was to to realize okay. I've done this MP thing for a little while. Uh, some aspects of it have been rewarding. Some less so, but it's okay. I will take the good that I can from it, and I will go back to what I think I probably should be doing, which is to complete law school and and hopefully become a, a judge advocate for the Army. And, of course, it was in doing so that I was able to put a lot of heart and soul into the creation of the Veterans Project, which helped me immensely uh, and while I was in law school uh, I was fortunate enough to and maybe some people wouldn't look at it this way but I did I thought it, the opportunity in, it, in itself was just such a an anomaly and, and I wanted to, to take it if I, if I could uh, and that was that I actually deployed for a short time to Afghanistan between my second and third years of law school um, I, at that point I was in, in part due to the Veterans Project and in part due to, you know, some sort of serious soul-searching and um, some of the turning it around in terms of mentoring others that I mentioned, uh, which does give you a sort of renewed sense of purpose and, you know, makes you feel better almost about your own experiences. Um, I went to Afghanistan. Uh, I, you know, the mission that we were doing was, was a little rough, but I worked with a fantastic group of people uh, and, and in fact, one of them, um, I uh, became much more than just friends with. He is now my husband. Um, so I was very fortunate in a place where I certainly never anticipated this to be the case to find uh, to find love again, and, uh, and and to have that come into my life at that time, and to have changed it as as much as it has now to the point where I can sit here today and say yes. I am, I am happy and it is possible to get here. It can just take a whole heck of a lot of work and, and patience and belief. It, that's huge for me to be able to say. Uh, I think, you know, maybe five years ago, if you told me that I would be doing this and saying this at this moment, I would not have believed you um, from where I was then. Uh, and, again, that's uh, a testament, if you will, to the remarkable... <laughs> Uh, resiliency sometimes that you have to dig deep and find when things continue to test you in a way even after the initial shock of the horrific experiences worn off that you just can't seem to shake and um, to do a lot of shaking to get to get here but I am so so glad and fortunate and I feel very lucky to, to be sitting here in this position and um, uh, you know I wish it was for any other reason in the world, but we sometimes don't get to pick the way that these things work. We just have to take the good that we can from them and uh, and apply it to help others. Yeah, well, it's it's great to see you doing so well, Jenna. Um, thanks again for coming on the podcast. Uh, any final uh, shout outs you want to give or um, people you want to thank or anything like that before we let you go? I want to thank you, Evan. You, man, I, I tell you what, I, I try to keep up with, and, and that's just on the social media, keep up with all the good things that you're doing uh, and all the ways that you're pushing yourself, and I am constantly amazed by it and uh, and makes me tired just looking at it, um, but I, you know, I want to be like you when I grow up, you're awesome, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm so grateful to have had this opportunity to talk about this stuff, you know, it, it doesn't matter how much time goes by, uh, catching up with with old friends on on a a truly remarkable and wonderful individual uh that that is something i will always cherish and want to do no matter how much time continues to pass well thank you jenna and thank you for coming on the podcast and i'd also like to thank you for keeping your composure while i lost it (laughs) so you're supposed you're the widow it was more traumatic for you you're supposed to be the one losing it i'm supposed to be the one comforting you so um (laughs) Good job making me look bad. But, uh, <laughs> thanks anyway. Okay, and um, run a few miles to make yourself feel better. Yeah. <laughs>
I'll say uh, one last thing I want to say about John, um, which I, I said at his memorial speech was, um, you know, if you could, like, go back in time magically and we could essentially pick who was in that Humvee at the time, John's the type of guy who would literally, like, fight you tooth and nail to make sure he's the one who had to make the sacrifice, not you. Because, yep. like, I mean, that's just the type of person he is. Um, and, I mean, we could we could fill another... 10 podcasts with John stories, uh, recounting stories from college, but um, we'll, we'll save those for in person for another day. Sounds good. All right. Any, um, if you're listening and you want to donate to Folds of Honor, I'll uh, post the link uh, below this podcast. Uh, Jenna, if you have any resources you want to tell people to donate to, you can send over those links and I'll also post those below. Okay. Thank you. All right, uh, good catching up to you. We'll, uh, we'll catch up with you later. Sounds great. Bye.